Hi, my name is Aretha Dorsey. I am a mother and a grandmother. I also um, am a member of Social Action for Racial Justice. I um, am a part of a sub educational committee, and we have uh, met with the superintendent over three or four years, uh, the superintendent board, uh, board and members. I am very concerned about uh, what's going on with the school. I am very concerned for change. And the reason that I am running is due to that. Uh, I want change for all of our children. I want everybody to have an equal uh, a, a chance to have um, a successful future. And um, basically I run to try to see what I can do to make a difference. My name is Pierce Curtis Smith. I was born in England and immigrated to North America when I was three, to the United States when I was five. I grew up in Appalachia in Pennsylvania, first in hill farm country and then coal mining country. I joined the Air Force when I was 23. And during a deployment to Guantanamo Bay looking after Cuban migrants and Haitian refugees saw people that were willing to risk their lives to get a piece of something that I took for granted, and that was the catalyst for me becoming a U.S. citizen. I ended up spending 23 years in the military, finishing at Air National, the Bureau of the National Guard at Andrews Air Force Base, working national programs. I'm a logistician. That is the skill set I plan to apply to this position should you entrust me with it. I want to ensure that Whatever else happens, our schools do not lack resources. I do not believe that it is fair to criticize an organization for failing to meet expectations unless you have given them the resources that they need in order to do their job. I believe in American exceptionalism. I believe that we can do that. I believe that America ought to have a public educational system that is second to none. There is no reason for us not to. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, William Yale. Some of you may know me as the Critter Gear for your local critters around here. I'm a native of Kent County. My family's been in this community since roughly 1665. They served our community and I have as well. My reason for running for the boards is because I have a son at the high school and I spent all last year watching some of the uh, things that he had to go through as an educational system combined by our low standard of performance there. So it's not uh, very, you know, not a big thought to find out why I would run. And it's about reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's about teaching kids what to learn, or how to learn, not what to learn. And I'm a doer. I'm not a talker. I mean, I may talk, but I like to do. And in my time in King County, I took my Elks Lodge as one of the youngest members of CEO of the Elks Lodge from my entering at $800 to a year later, $8,000. I served on the Public Landings Board and we preserve the largest amount of public land that's used from the public anywhere in the state of Maryland. Okay, I kept the uh, route race, which everybody thought, oh, that's a small thing for 25 years, but that's what brought Sunday to that event, and it brought all our communities together to raise money. I started uh, part of a homeless program where we started with two guys frozen in the snow, and now we have 11, and our first one is going out to get permanent housing. So there are ways to fix anything. And I believe in that. And it's a matter of dissecting the problem. Everybody's going to be asking tonight, what are you going to do to fix it? Well, we're not talking about a car with a flat tire here. We're going to talk about a car that has rust, broken. It's about as low as it can be with a 30% success rate in the state of Maryland. So I'm going to fight to change that because our kids are our gift. They are our future. And they deserve the education that we can give them. And we don't need to sow things into education that aren't there already. I have those children in my house every weekend of every denomination, girls, boys, and everything else. They get along just fine. So let's let them. Let's give them the tools to do their job. Yes, I uh, would like to thank the League of Women Voters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, public, and my fellow candidates. I was born and raised here in King County, Maryland. I was both educated here in the Queen King County Public School System and the Queen Anne's County Public School System. I have a master's degree in education from Bowie State University in curriculum and instruction. I've been in the education field for over 15 years now, and I'm currently a fifth grade teacher in Montgomery County Public Schools and a summer school instructor for our Horizons of Kent and Queen Anne's here in our own community. Um, I am wrapping up my first term on our local school board and currently where I serve as vice president. 
Um, one of the things that I have noticed with education, especially in Kent County, is that we have accomplished a lot over um, a, a course of time, especially during the pandemic. Um, our students were at the middle of the pack when it came to uh, our first set of testing after the pandemic. We are incorporating in our school system new initiatives to bring teachers here and to make sure our teachers are valued. So at the end of the day, I want to continue to be a part of that work, a work that can help benefit the community and help transform the lives of our children, our parents, our educators. Thank you. Thank you, Nike. I want to thank the Women's League and Sam for hosting this show. My name is Frank Rhodes, and I moved to Kent County in the 70s. I have a BA at uh, Washington College, and my wife and I, um, both of us work in this area. I have a business uh, right up the street. I build furniture. I do furniture restoration and upholstery. I also have, we have two children, and my wife Susan and I decided to have our children go to the public school system. We were in the private school system, and I wanted change. I wanted to find out what it's like around here. I wanted to meet new people. I wanted to find out what it's like for our children to be in the real world. I'm not saying that private schools are, but I wanted them to get a different kind of education. So at the uh, Kent County High School, I'm a mentor, and I have a few mentees, and I found out that uh, we need our kids, we need excitement in our school. We need our kids to want to learn. There needs to be a spark between the teachers and the student, and I want to be a part of that. I want to be involved. I want to attend all the, go to all the schools and meet with the, the different people that work and find out the issues that are going on and not just take the issues in and not discuss it with anyone. Thank you. Grew up in Kent County, grew up in Chester Town. I attended public schools here and I was lucky enough to find a job that I've been able to make uh, not only my profession but my avocation. I've worked for the Kent County News. 36 years or six months this month. I'm the fourth generation of my family at that new school, and I have watched two generations of young adults come through the school system. Um, I have been a coach for 30 years. I've been on the school board for the last eight years, and it's, they've been trying times. I mean, uh, we've had to make some very difficult decisions. Difficult. They were difficult, and what made them so difficult is they were unpopular. Um, they've worn out to be what needed to be done. We closed two elementary schools and we changed the bus contract. We made a mistake when we made that bus contract, but we were able to correct it very quickly. Um, like I said, I've devoted a large, the biggest part of my life to the citizens of Kent County through my job and my community service. Um, we, as Mr. Johnson said, we've been on the board together for four years. We have had some successes. I think that sometimes the little successes get over, overshadowed by the one or two really, I mean everybody's uh, focused on test scores and then they don't realize that we have a lot of little victories under, underneath the one big loss. Um, I recognize that we still have a lot of work to be done and that's why I'm seeking another term. I believe that public schools should provide the same opportunities for all students and that we should provide the adequate funding so that they can reach their potential. Uh, my name is uh, Chuck Walsh. I currently live in Millington. I moved into Maryland from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I started teaching 27 years ago. Um, I had started my career in Queen Anne's County, but then I moved into Kent County. Um, I taught for Kent County for about three years, and I took a job in Delaware, where I currently am working at the early college program at Delaware State University. I have a degree, a bachelor's in secondary math education. I have a master's in secondary math education and also a master's in athletic administration. Um, I have devoted my life to children. I have been teaching pretty much anything from pre-algebra pre all the way to AP Calc and college algebra. I know what it takes to get these kids through. I've seen it. However, the teachers need those resources to do their jobs. We need to not only give them the, the teachers the resources, but the administrators and the students. Because it just doesn't allow it just on us. I've been in the classroom day in, day in and day out. I'm teaching a very hard schedule. 
and I'm working with students in a Title I school district, Thunder Dell State. I'm willing to put in the time and the effort that it takes. I am doing this because of this. I want the equity in our schools. I want to provide all those resources that we need, and we need to work as a community. And I think that there could, is a little bit of a divide, but we need to bring it back. And that's why I'm running for board. Yes, <laughs> I find the question puzzling. Um, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm English by birth. <laughs> that means that I carry the history of the English people behind me. And I can tell you that in my youth, going to see the film Gandhi in Pennsylvania and having my stepmother loudly proclaim that the intermission would be a fine time to go and get a drink. Um, it was pretty mortifying. We were clearly the bad guys in that story. I think that we talk about accountability, talk about honesty, talk about transparency. All of those things can be applied to individual behavior, or organizational behavior, or cultural behavior. And I think that in this case, we're talking about cultural norms. Are we able to have as individuals, are we strong enough and honest enough to have a disinterested examination of our own past? I think that having come to this country as a foreigner, I don't look at history the same way that I would if I were born here. I know that I feel a degree of shame when I am reminded of the offenses against humanity that have been carried out in the name of, of Crown in the, in the English history. Um, I can empathize with what it must feel like to be someone with a heritage that is intrinsically linked to the Confederacy. But it is not the fur purse, it is recent purse, and the shadows of it still permeate our country. We're never going to leave that behind until we've gone through the uncomfortable process of addressing it. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm a history buff, uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time studying the Civil War. And, uh, you know, when you study something like that, the world out there wonders if you are sitting on one side or another. I ride a horse in the cavalry, and I present history so people can see what it was like. So, of course, slavery is one of the biggest things in Civil War history. And one of the reasons that I talk about it as often as I do and I get controversial about it is because we don't want to go back there. You know, in a country where we've had riots and separation and division, we need to learn from those things. History is what teaches us. So to either slant history or bury history, it never goes away. It is our history. And one thing that I find that's interesting about how we talk about history and how we talk about all these very important issues is that sometimes I think that we sometimes, in our hope to educate our students in these various things, we seem to want to so divide. Um, I have a child at the high school, and they, I have all his friends at the high school. I have black girls, white girls, it's Hispanics, everything. They don't have a racial issue. They want to learn. They want to know. But they don't look at each other and see black first. They see their friend first. That's the kind of teaching we want. To have them be inclusive. To have them understand that every man is created equal. That's what our Constitution was about. And this will be something that we'll constantly have to improve upon. We have a lot of work to do. But let's not jade these children from the beginning. Let's give them the opportunity to realize that they are all important. They are our future, regardless of their sex, their color, their gender, their religion, and they are all our future. Yes, um, the answer is yes. Um, ever since I've been educated in the public school setting, it's always been a historical concept that's been taught um, at almost every level from starting at, with our own Maryland history in fourth grade all the way up into our AP history courses. Um, and we must understand that slavery is a part of our American history. It's a part of our United States history. Um, and it, it's so, quote unquote, you know, it has a lot to do with our democracy, our, our country and the nation we live in, the relationships we have, uh, and the relationships that we need to bridge and reconcile with our neighbors, um, some who look like us and some who don't look like us. 
Um, so I can't see any reason why it wouldn't, shouldn't, and couldn't be taught in our local school system. Um, but we can do a, a job at making it more inquiry-based, making an investigation. Why? This, why was there slavery? Why did it happen? What did we learn from that? Letting students explore, letting them get a concept of seeing what it looked like right here in our county. We have a very rich history. We have a rich state with history. And I think we need to do a better job of being more investigative with that history and letting students experience it close up, personal, in a way that makes sense to them, but a way that can enlighten the experiences of all the children to unify them. Thank you. My answer is going to be very short. Yes, we need to teach slavery in school. It's part of our American fabric. And the reason being, it's American history, and everyone should know about it. It's a part of our past that's uh, not very um, wonderful, but we have to teach it in our schools, and everyone needs to know. Um, we have a lot of racial issues in Kent County, and uh, we need to, to straighten that out also. Thank you. I agree with everybody else. Uh, I'll tell you, I did not look at my questions until Saturday night. I had a bunch of other things on my mind. I said, oh, I better look at these questions. And when I read that question, I, I was like, why are we being asked this question? Of all the things we could be asked about, they're going to ask us about slavery. So first of all, I'll just get it out of the way. Board of Education members don't have anything to do with curriculum. That's the first thing. Uh, second of all, Slavery is probably the most consistent, enduring thread through American history from the very, from the very beginning. You, you know, it, it predates the Civil War and it's taking us all the way up, up to here. You cannot, I mean, when I think about, there's the big picture of the Emancipation Proclamation, Abraham Lincoln and his legacy like that, but like Mr. Johnson said, think of Kent County. How would you explain to a kid who goes to Garnett Elementary School who Henry Highland Garnett was if you didn't say he was a slave? You know? How do you explain the Underground Railroad, which we now know goes through, went through Millington and may have had a stop right out here on the Clark Road? How do you tell them about Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass? How do you talk about Juneteenth is now a federal holiday? How do you explain Juneteenth without saying its roots are in slavery? Um, all the Civil War, I mean, all the Supreme Court cases, back to 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, which tells us equal but separate. And then finally, the Civil Rights Act in 1965, that says that's unconstitutional. So my question, my statement is, absolutely we should be teaching history. How can you move forward unless you look back? What distinguishes us from other countries is the fact that we can accept the very ugliness of our, of our own history as opposed to sanitizing it like other foreign countries. Yes, <clears throat> we should be teaching slavery in school. Um, it has been part of our U.S. history and world history courses since when we were in high school. It has not gone away. It is still there. We need, it is part of our institution of this country. The things that happened were wrong, but we learned from them. That's how we built our country forward. History is history. I teach math. It's in mathematics. I teach it at the college level that I'm at. We teach that. It is part of the history. It's in every curriculum, not just history. It's in English. It's in science. It's in math. Some of our famous mathematicians were during the slave era. If you look at our medicines, some of them are famous slaves. We have to teach it in our history. We can't just say no. A lot of things we have came from that era. So we need to keep containing. It is there, it has been, it's nothing new. It's We are now teaching it more and more in our curriculum because it's part of our history. Just like I teach, you know, Albert Einstein. It's part of history. I, ha I teach it all. It's part, I don't, when I teach mathematics, I teach AP Cal. I don't give them the tangent line theory and say, here it is use it. I teach them the theory behind it. The kids have to know where it came from, how it was developed, and why we use it. And it's as simple as finding the curve on a line. That's the thing. So we have to teach these kids everything. If we just throw something at them and move on to the next minute, 
we haven't taught them anything, they're not going to re remember it or use it. And that's what our goal is as a board, to help the teachers get it into their minds, keep it, and use it. For me, which you can see, I'm a woman of color. I, myself, wish this question did not have to be asked, but because we're in 2022 and it shouldn't be something we should have, should have to ask, it should be already done. So my answer is yes. I am a black woman, a mother, a grandmother, and I feel like the public school is responsible for teaching the facts. So teaching slavery and its aftermath is definitely something that should be taught. It is history, and it is just as important as any other part of history that we teach now. Um, I feel like it's very important because it has contributed to America in a great way. Um, I feel like that a lot of what America is built on was due to slavery. Off the backs of others, wealth was built. Like it or not, it was. We didn't like it, but you know, it was built. And um, I do feel as though that we should also include our background before, as African Americans, before we came here. And I don't feel like that we should just teach that we were just slaves, because we actually were human beings who existed before we came to America. We were a people who were strong. We buried strong families, strong fathers who had strong sons. We had communities, and our communities had doctors. We had, I'm sorry, but we had a community, and we ran our community with very talented people, and I feel our children would benefit from that. The first one is turn off your phone because I'm grabbing at my pockets for the last 20 minutes thinking it was my phone. So, uh, school safety. Well, it's not just a local problem. It's not just a state problem. We're all aware it's a national problem. It, there's a heinous amount of shootings out there, and, and I can't tell you this is just terrible. Um, so the state's going to approach what they want to do. But we as a county, we, there are things we can do. We can harden our schools. That's a terrible thing to have to say, but we can. We have security at the high school. We should have security at all schools. We have security in here tonight, and I want to thank those gentlemen for being secure. That's the first thing, okay? That's the most obvious thing. We have break-proof doors. They have a latch on them, okay? Your door locks from the outside. In the old days, okay, I'm older. I see some people that might have been raised. There were horror stories because in order to keep kids in schools, they locked those doors with chains. And then one time a school burned up and everybody burned up in it. Then things changed. We didn't know what to do. But we have modern technology and we can lock these doors. Now, I work for the college. I don't work for the schools. We also have to educate our teachers. Heat comes on and teachers have a tendency to open that door to let the air out. And we have to make sure they close it. So right there, very simple. Keep the doors locked, okay? Number two, we have security. Number three, you see something, you say something. It has to start before the problem. 99% of these problems with school shootings have to do with somebody that had a problem long before the problem came along. And every time we have one, and you sit long enough, you hear this problem. So if we aren't working in our community, our churches, our schools, and all these other programs, we can prevent it before it ever happens. You know, uh, I'm a bit of a cowboy, and I grew up not liking bullies. And I had a 275-pound brother that tossed me around like a rag doll. And I learned it didn't matter how big you were, that tree fell. And so I, I don't believe in bullying, and that's one place we can start. Um, yeah, school safety is very important. I um, want to highlight, since being on the board, we were able to, this year, put a resolution forward to prioritize school safety funding. Um, at any cost for our school system employees, our students, our parents, and our stakeholders. Um, one of the ways that when we look at school safety is both an external and an internal. 
So we have to keep the external building safe from the outside. But internally, we need to make sure things are great for our students and our teachers. I believe that down the line, we can encourage our school administration to focus on those things that are internally keeping our students and our children from being safe, such as more trauma-informed practices, more social-emotional learning. Our students sometimes, you look at safety just in the realm of school shootings and uh, weaponry, but sometimes the greatest safety is the students' mental health and their well-being. So making putting that to the front forward. Um, one is including our stakeholders, our fellow citizens, to do more touring of our schools in the beginning of the year, show what safety practices are going on in our schools, doing a walkthrough so a, a parent can see what a safe door looks like, a parent can see the exits and the entrances. I have a case where we had a parent during one of our storms in my own school district just ran into the building, just not sure if our student was safe. So showing our, student, our parents our safety plans uh, and our community members our safety plans. And again, just making sure we're prioritizing school safety at, no, at any cost to make sure everyone is safe. Obviously, safety is one of the biggest concerns these days. And I feel that after visiting all of the schools, uh, five public schools in this area, meeting with the principals, I've been able to walk through the schools and see exactly what they need and what some of the principals want. One of the main things is um, we need mental health um, people to help more with that. I think with the new uh, gun law that the uh, Congress has passed, there'll be more funds for that. I think with the Kerwin program, there'll be more funds. And I think we need, we need respect out of the students. That's one of the main things. We need to have them respect the teachers and respect their peers and the people they're with. Because I notice out of the high school where I've been mentoring, there's not a lot of respect. And I want to change that. And I know we can do it. I know we can make the change, but we have to be very proactive. And especially on the Eastern Shore, we want to be proactive with all the schools around here. We want to lead. We don't want to follow. We want to lead. And we don't want one of these problems to happen here. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. I think that the policies and practices we have are, are probably enough. The problem is they're not enforced. Like, uh, I guess as Mr. Gale said, you know, teachers avoid the temptation to prop your door open because it's hot, your exterior, your exterior door. Lock your classroom, shut and lock your classroom doors. I think we need to tighten our visitor policy. Um, for example, when we had that unfortunate stabbing in February, there were members of the community that were just sort of walking in and out of the school, which they should never have been able to do. That just sort of added to the confusion. Um, Principals need to enforce the visitor policy. They need to enforce the law, the, the rules. Um, as Mr. Johnson said, the current school board at our, actually we're getting ready to adopt the budget, made it a matter of fact, would not pass the budget until we ensured that there would be funding for, safe, for safety in schools. Um, so we're using some of our, we got a Leeds grant, over $8 million. And we're using it more innovatively than some of our, our neighboring counties. Um, we are poning up the money for 200 staff members on August 23rd and 24th that are all going to get the active shooting training. Um, also, with the Leeds grant, that Leeds grant, we've been able to employ more mental health workers and social workers. So school safety is more, there was a time when school safety was all about physical safety. Um, the threats from the outside coming inside. Now, mental health, uh, especially since COVID is exposed, really how fragile our kids and our staff are. And it's so it's school safety and mental health. Uh, school safety, as being as a teacher, we have, as a teacher, to feel safe, have to be knowing that our administrators above us are enforcing the rules to make us safe. As a classroom teacher, I need to make sure that in the front office, that people entering our buildings have been cleared by the front office. That they're walking through my building, they have a visitor badge on, it means they've been to the front office, um, being cleared in. You know, making sure that whoever's in our building has been, as I say, cleared. It's huge. You know, locking doors, is a great idea, a great concept, but when you got that revolving door for kids going to the bathroom, 
which is they have there's we cannot stop them it is they are allowed to go there has to be making sure the kids feel safe in the hallways and a lot of school districts and where i come in delaware is a law that every high school and middle school has an sro in the building and it's not just there to put an officer in there just to say, hey, I'm good, I'm safe. I got a cop in the building, that's what they're there for. No, in our buildings, the officer becomes part of our staff. And they are helping and they're part of the kids walk up to them, they are part of it. And the kids go to the officers a lot of times before they come to us because they feel comfortable with them. <laughs> we need to have that safe environment where the students and staff and administrators will have that with the officers. Because it is there, you know, having it in there. We have the funding coming from Maryland and nationals to make sure that there is school funding for school safety. Where it's spent, I ran EMS for 22 years. I know what the mental is, I know what the physical is. It has to come into the schools so the students have. Because as a teacher, until COVID, we kind of looked at it and left it alone. Now, our kids need it more than ever. And we need to make sure the funding and resources are there for not only us teachers, but everybody in the system. Yes, I'm very much concerned about the safety of the staff as well as all the students. Uh, it's one of the things that I, one of the views that I have that I'm working on and uh, would like to work on when I get become a board member in that way. Uh, one of the things that I believe that contributes to what is going on in the schools, and uh, I think a fellow, um, one of the people up here rather, had mentioned, <laughs> sorry about that, uh, was bullying. But bullying and discipline is at an all-time high. Um, lack of discipline, if you ask me. Um, bullying, because a lot of bullying is ignored. Uh, bullying reports are ignored and not answered. And because of that, you have a lot of children that are frustrated, and they are sometimes suicidal. All kinds of things happen as a result of this. Uh, different behavior problems, they may act out in different ways. Um, we need to bring attention to those things, and we need to deal with them, so that that would limit a lot of what's going on in the school. Also, having a standard. I had mentioned before in another form that uh, the regulations and the rules that the school has already set many times, they're not being kept. Uh, they're not being enforced. So we need to enforce the rules and the regulations that have already been set into place. And I feel like that every building should have a standard. And when we send our children to school, they should be um, expected to act a certain way. And if you have a standard, then they will respect one another. Also, we should have a better uh, make sure that we monitor camera mo to monitor um, the access to the school. You know, when people come in, to make sure that um, we know who they are. Maybe the teachers could even wear badges and IDs so that we know that they are teachers, etc. First of all, I'm glad that we didn't waste any time getting down to brass tacks and admitting that this conversation is about America's pandemic of gun violence. My step further was a gunsmith. It put uh, meat and bread on the table, kept a roof over our heads. He specialized in revolutionary era military arms. I spent my childhood in gun shows up and down the eastern seaboard. I'm familiar, uh, deeply steeped in that culture. I'm a gun owner myself. There are a lot that I think about this. I hope I've got enough time to put it all in. Um, Given the challenge of protecting our children from a highly motivated, well-equipped, and well-earned student is a monumental, well-earned aggressor, who oftentimes is a student or prior student, is a monumental task. This problem is not limited to schools. It is a cultural problem, and I quite honestly think that asking uh, educators to solve America's gun violence problem is allowing our constituents and legislatures to sidestep their responsibility. But it is nonetheless an issue that we have to deal with. I think that we often overlook that mass shooters in schools are not just murderers, it's a murder suicide. Keeping that in mind, a school resource officer may not be a deterrent. If the shooter is looking to end their life in their act of violence, it may be an attraction. I think that what we can do 
is make sure that we put resources in schools that allow us to mitigate the violence or the consequences of violence. As a military medic, we have made vast strides in first aid trauma medicine, and if we train our personnel within the schools to use quick clot, combat application tourniquets and Israeli bandages, we could mitigate the violence that occurs. I would be happy to speak to any of you out there about this problem at length after this forum. Thank you very much. I have uh, been active since I was in high school, in middle school. Actually, Mr. Welsh, I do not forget, we went on a trip to Hagerstown at the Student Council um, back in the day. I don't know if you remember. But I um, have always been a proponent of the Maryland Association of Student Councils. I have always been a proponent of student voting rights. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things in, in board makeup is we are governed by a set of laws, it's our Code of Maryland regulations, which define what the membership of the school board entails and looks like. Uh, for a student to be added to uh, the school board, you have to get it first approved by the state legislature um, um, for it to be passed, to be added, to really make it a full-fledged voting member. That will take some time, but again, it's just not my opinion, it's a board of other individuals. I believe student voice is important. Student voice is what carries us through to understand what our students need. So making sure that voice is elevated and is heard and it's appreciated will be key uh, as we move down the line, especially coming out of a pandemic, especially as we are getting into new innovative practices and transformational learning. So it's something that needs to be discussed, but I have seen it work in other school districts and I believe with diligence and understanding and hard work, we can make it work here. In my opinion, I've seen the uh, school member on the board this year, and the gentleman spoke. He had great ideas, and he represented the school. Now you've got a board of five people, and you've got one person from the school representing hundreds and hundreds of people, and I feel that they should have a voice. I don't know about the, uh, the voting, the regulations in Maryland, but I think someone from the school should have a voice because they represent the school. They're there for the students. They're there for the people that study and learn, and they need a voice. That's my opinion. Yeah, it came to a forefront this year. We had a, an active, energetic um, board member who had a lot of good ideas and was not afraid to share them and took took the board to task, and on many occasions he was correct in doing so. Um, as Mr. Johnson said, and maybe this is me taking the cowardly way out, and I'll acknowledge that, it's not a decision that the board can make. We can't just decide next year that the student member of the board will be a voting board member. It has to go to the legislature, and it has to start with our county commissioners who, prob who usually will be the ones to carry the water for the school district. That's, for example, how school board terms in Kent County change from six years to four years. Um, I think that there are some issues that a student member shouldn't vote on. I don't think they should vote on personnel. I don't think they should vote on, on, on the budget. Um, that doesn't mean that they can't express their opinion on, on anything that they want to and I think a board should be um, admonished if they don't encourage that from their, their student member. Um, I don't know why a student member of the board would be allowed to vote when someone that age is not allowed to do a lot of other things. So I have mixed opinions. Um, I can be. I, I support uh, hearing when a student member has to say. One of the other things that will make it problematic in Kent County is, and it's not only just Kent County, because I listened to the uh, General Assembly when they were debating this. If we have a voting student member of the board, we have six people, and it makes a tie. We've got to figure out what we're going to do about that. Um, I am a support of student voice. Um, when I started in Maryland, I was the 
Regional Director for the Northeastern Shore Student Council. So I have been a very um, vocal and student voice. Um, I was actually part of when Queen Anne's County Public Schools got their two members on the board. Um, I was part of the committee with Dr. Williams and that started that. Um, they're, they're, the way the student member of the board technically works under legislative law is that we petition Annapolis to say, hey, here's the language we want, this is what we want that student to do, and then gets kicked to a referendum within the county. And then the county citizens will eventually end up voting yes or no. That's how we move it forward in a clean hands. There are only two in the state of Maryland that have full voting rights, and that means that they can vote on anything. Then you have what their school districts have, the opinion vote, which means it's pretty much what Kent has. That is a student who voices their opinion and allows that student to vote that has no, no restriction on that vote of six to five or whatever it is. It's just, here's my vote, but it really doesn't count against the school boards. <clears throat> MSDE has a full voting right member that sits as a student who is elected every February who is elected by all member schools of the state of Maryland, who is appointed by the governor, who sits up at MSDE and is a full voter. The only thing they are not allowed to vote on are two things, personnel and budget. Everything else they are permitted to vote on if the district gives them permission. I am full support of having the students because they're the ones that are in the day-to-day -day operations. For me, I would um, support changing it but I would want to know more about it and more about the details and what they were, um, what he could go vote on and what he couldn't vote on. Um, I actually attended a board meeting where this topic came up and I know that um, they have discussed it and it has been considered. Um, so if I become a board member and it is something that I have the right to vote on, then I will consider all things that, you know, all the information that I'll be given. And at that time, I would make a decision. But I do feel like that a student would have a lot to contribute because he goes to the school. Um, he's speaking for a lot of other students that don't get to voice their opinion. So I do feel like that he pay, plays a, bit, a very important part and needs to be here. I would support the student representative having full voting, voting rights. Now, that's an opinion. Again, we've talked about the bureaucratic hurdles that would have to be crossed in order to make that happen. But if we think 100 years ago, someone of high school age would have been apprenticed into a career and building a family. We say, I want our children to have responsibility. I can tell you that in the military, when we promote someone to surgeon, we don't promote them to surgeon when they're ready to be surgeon. We promote them to surgeon when they have fulfilled the ability to perform in the next lowest rank. We then promote them, promote them, and their mentors and equals stand with them to ensure that they won't fail. I can think of nothing more insulting than telling students who are part of the school system that we are critical of that they are going to be the representation of the student's voice, but their voice will not have a, uh, a meaningful impact. As far as whether or not it's wise to give that ability to a high school student, I would say that this is an important lesson about democracy. Democracy often elevates people into office that are unqualified. The responsibility is on the record to ensure that they do not waste their vote. And it is the opportunity for a well-meaning candidate to grow into that position. So I think that the idea is a good one. I like it. It appeals to me. Thank you. Hmm, good question. Well, I'm running for the school board. I'm running because the community and the parents feel that the school board has let them down. Our school board sits behind this fact, which I heard tonight twice, that we can't do this, this is law. We can't do this, this is judgment. Well, you know, the superintendent sits behind the state as cover. The school board sits behind the superintendent as cover. The teachers sit behind the union as cover. Tell me who's covering our kids. It's us. It's parents. We want rights. I heard that young man speak often at that school board. 
Many people forgot when he got accepted to college and wasn't worried about getting kicked out of school. He lambasted that school board, told them how terrible they had treated him. You all remember that. Not a word was said. Don't apology to that young man. So damn right he has a right to vote. Everybody's telling these kids what to do. I hear, oh, they must respect their teachers. I was taught respect is earned. Okay? I've been out of that school system. Why don't you take a good long look and squat around in Kent County High? It's probably like a freaking prison. The teachers are acting like wardens. Hats are being ripped off people's heads. I mean, a guy is walking around with a toilet seat because that's his hall pass. That's the best we can do? Really? And to hear this board can't do it, if I'm a board member, I will question everything. I will go so far outside the box, I'll be calling my congressman. Because we're going to fix this problem. I don't want to sit here and go, oh, Couch says this and Couch says that. Oh, this person says this and this person. This is about our children's future. We have to get serious about it. Parents have to stand up. And we have to have a bill of rights for our parents. So yes, by all means, let that child vote. First of all, Kerwin was set up um, about three or four or five years ago, um, and it was mandated by the state of Maryland to produce three, $250 million to $350 million to support our schools. One of the biggest parts of the Kerwin is to help with mental health, and we need that in our schools desperately because a lot of the students, and I've noticed, especially at the high school where I mentor, is that they don't really pay attention. They don't respect a lot of the teachers. I remember a lot of them, they're not supposed to wear hats, and the teachers say, hey, you're not supposed to wear a hat, even the principal out there, and then they, they'll walk around the whole center and they come back with a hat on, or a do-rag, or whatever. I think from day one, that has to stop. Again, we need respect. If we get respect with the students, and the teachers, and the people that run the school, it's gonna greatly help our student body. We need to teach our children young because when they get out of school, they're going to be going to a job and they can't act like they do in school. We need to raise, we need, as Kent County, we need to lead, as again, of all the counties on the Eastern Shore, we have the ability to do better. We can do much better. And it starts from the ground level, from the elementary schools to the middle school and up to the high school. We want to send out students that have the potential to get jobs and treat people well and be treated well. And if you treat people well, it's going to come back to help you out. Thank you. The Kerwin Commission started before COVID. Before COVID. It, the train was on the track before that. And the big question locally, I just watched the county commissioners forum last week, and one of the questions was asked of them was, how are they, how are they going to fund it? It's going to be a big burden for the county. And if it's not funded, our school system, our students, our staff will feel, will feel that. What I think might be the salvation for our school system, at least short term, is going to be the LEADS grant we just got. It's an $8 million grant, no strings attached, it was non-competitive. Kent County, unlike some of the counties around us, have found really innovative ways to not only support our kids, help close the academic and achievement gap, um, help retain, re recruit and retain. I mean, we're in a labor shortage. Math teachers, as you know, you just learned that yourself, are in short supply. We, with the $8 million, we're doing some of the, the really nice things, for example. Full-time staff are getting a stipend, you know, one, uh, each year for two years. Free membership at the YMCA. No insurance premiums in November and December. We've been able to buy, to um, hire social workers, mental health providers, um, increased tutoring, all the kinds of things that I think this teacher may have been asking about. Like I said, Kerwin all struck. I mean, nobody could have imagined a pandemic was going to hit us the way we did. So the LEADS grant is responding to that emergency as opposed to Kerwin being pre-COVID. This is what we're doing post-COVID. As a in-classroom teacher, um, the mental health, not only for me, coming back off of looking at that screen for almost six and a half hours a day along with my students and bringing them back into the classroom, it's kind of like we're reteaching them again from before the pandemic. Where the teacher is looked at, we need to provide all that help, all that care to them, along with trying to keep ourselves from sinking. Um, 
we as a board need to provide the resources to the staff. And not only that, like, you know, Trish is saying, bringing in all those helpers for the students on that need that help, along with the teachers, because it is drowning us. So we're the ones that to see every day in the classroom the kid who's falling behind. As a math teacher, it is across the country, you look at the math scores that went from here down to here in two years. As the teacher who is being looked at in that box, because we all look at math and English scores, that's all everyone looks at. You're seeing college is dropping SAT scores now. Why? Because they're not getting them from the pandemic. Providing those services as tutoring after school, bringing in extra support during the school day, I only have them for that 85 minutes. And that 85 minutes, I must go from A to B within the beginning and the end of the semester. The supports have to be put in place to assist me, to assist those students. Data, Delaware has done one of the best things they've done. They postpone all our data information for five years. And that is because they see that data has hurt. But as a teacher in the school system, we're still looking at our data, we're looking at the data they returned this past year, and we're gonna look at how we can grow them next year. Because we can't look at the data pre-COVID, because it, it's not the same. We are looking current and moving forward and putting everything we can into place to help our kids. For me, um, I'm learning a lot about the curling, uh, foam learning, different things like that. Um, I've learned that it doesn't work for Kent County Public Schools. It kind of works against it because it doesn't fit who we are and our situation. In other words, we have a declining enrollment, which causes us to uh, need more funding. But the same funding, in other words, the same funding that would be demanded and needed um, for us to run our schools, if we had the enrollment that we need to have, is still needed with the declining enrollment. So that causes us to need a lot more money. And the Carolyn Act is made for a school that's bigger than what we have or has more students than we have. So that's a problem. And right now it's just not working. I've heard a lot about the LEADS grant, and I'm hoping that it will solve a lot of our problems, that they will bring in a lot of resources that we need for our children. Um, you're right, we do have a lot of children that's dealing with a lot of mental issues, um, lack of hope, et cetera, from the pandemic. I feel as though that we should address each student one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we shouldn't just look at them. A lot of times in the King County school system, they seem to be labeled, and nobody stops and answers a question, what are you going through, what's going on? We have to try to help our children, and a lot of it starts in elementary school. We also need to support the parent, I mean not the parents, the parents too, but we need to support the teachers because they know a lot that we don't see. So we need to communicate. Everybody needs to communicate, and it's going to take everybody for the problems to get solved that we're experiencing in the school system. I think that your question is multifaceted. I'll try and focus on the mental health aspect of your question. I think like a lot of issues that are facing this school district, uh, it's a resources issue. Um, you don't solve problems without the appropriate resources. Our school employees are, I, I'm not a mental health provider, an academic or, or an administrator. I am a, a logistician, so I would see that my role in solving that problem is to make sure that it is resourced adequately. I also think that there is some parallel to the gun violence issue. The mental health of our children is not something that affects only our schools. It is a reflection of our culture at large, and the support mechanisms that could help solve that problem would not be isolated to our schools. But within our schools, I think it is worth noting that prior to the academic, I saw the superintendent go to the commissioners and state what she needed as an effective budget to run her programs, and she was told that that was unreasonable and that she should come back with a reduced budget request, which she did. I have to presume that what she cut out was not academic, and that would lead me to believe that it could lie in the um, social services 
looking after mental health, being aware of what children are, are, are doing aspect. I have also saw the county commissioners grant her her reduced request and then turn around and tell the people of the county that they've given the school everything that they've asked for. That is dishonest. So one thing that I would ask for is the county commissioners to be more honest about what the school district asks for, why they're asking for it, and what they think ought to be cut out if they're not willing to meet that request. The, 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 sorry. Ask me more. Mental health is always important to our children. Uh, COVID locked them in their houses, kind of, on eight hours a day, basically, well, maybe not eight, but just about all day, where they had to learn on Zoom all by themselves. I said, that's too much. Teacher said, what else are they doing? They'd be in school. Well, yeah, they'd be socializing. They'd be doing all the things normal kids do. They didn't do that in their house. The parents had to work. They had to get their own sandwich. They stressed. They didn't know what to do with their time. They had no leadership, no friendship. Then they get back to school. And there's a lot of talk about they should respect their teachers. You're absolutely right, Frank Rhodes. They should. But teachers need to respect them. I have seen terrible respect for teachers. I saw a advisor. I had to come into school because that advisor not literally physically took the hat off my son's head. So when you ask why he didn't want to take his hat off, it's because somebody costed him. Okay. So as we go down, let's talk about this Cohen Commission. Okay. Is that the Cohen Act? Cohen Commission. That is the leading group that set out the Maryland uh, Blueprint for Maryland Futures Act. Okay, that was a great thing. We wanted to look at mental health. We wanted to look at saving salaries. We wanted to come up with ways to improve our teachers and standards and all this. Well, they've dumped six million million dollars in, and nothing has changed. So sometimes not just dumping money at a problem is going to work. It's, there's got to be transparency on where that money goes. Okay, so maybe one thing we ought to think outside the box is we're giving 90 minutes of class. I heard that come from somewhere, a teacher, you know, four or five classes. Maybe they need a recess. I'm up there, these students are getting distracted, they're getting bored, and they're going into the hallways and going up to the cafeteria to socialize and they're getting in trouble for it. Because there's no recess. They are locked down at that school. And everywhere they go, somebody's going, get back in your room. I've watched it. You know? How, is that the way you deal with COVID? Is double down on kids that are confused? You know, maybe we ought to try to reach them, you know? Where was the psychiatrist in when he came up with Marilyn's idea? We must face the facts that we're going to be with COVID, uh, the pandemic aftermath for a while. I eloquently told one of my colleagues that I teach sixth grade and the students are coming to me with third grade mentalities, third grade behaviors, because they haven't had a normal school year in fourth grade. That's when the pandemic hit fifth year, fifth grade we were online, and now sixth grade we started the year in mass. So we really won't get to a normal year until seventh, until they get to their seventh grade year with hopes. But one of the things that we don't do well, we, we focus too much, I do agree, we focus too much on all these academic data, but there is this thing called street data. It's to understand the students, what they bring to us daily. It's looking at their spiritual needs, it's looking at their physical needs, their social emotional needs, their, their daily needs, and then using that to inform our educators, inform our administration what is going to work for our students. We have to do a better job, and this is in every school district across the land, is that we focus too much on objectives, we focus too much on academic standards, and which is the best in which we're supposed to do by state law, but we have to focus more on how do we make it a child, a student feel individualized, that they are getting the best out of education, that they are supported on all levels. And that work doesn't just start at school, it also starts at home. We have to do a better job of bringing education to our children at home. Children spend more time with their families, their caregivers, than they are at school. So how do we return what they're learning? How do we ensure that the social emotional concepts that are being taught um, at school, the academic data, to help benefit, take that strain off our teachers? Nobody needs to work, you know, extra to do 20-page lesson plans. I mean, that's why I got into teaching at first, because 20-page lesson plans. But no one has to go do that. So how do we work together to assure that? In a little bit of way, I feel like this goes back to the question about slavery in terms of the curriculum and what you permit and what you don't permit. Um, 
I don't think it's a school board's job, and I'm not saying this because I don't want to make the decision. That's not a decision that we, we should be making. Um, what, what one person thinks is literature, somebody else might think is pornography. That's, a, you know, morals and everything else are, are relative, and what might be considered pornography today, 25 years down the road, will be considered a work of art. So I, I, I would stand my ground and would say I'm not going to take any books out of the library. Um, I think back to when I was in high school, um, and one of the books that I read, which I fell in love with, which is ironic because I wouldn't sit and read a book very long, um, was The Scarlet Letter. Now it's not taught. Um, in some school districts, it pulled off the books and it's censored. Um, I learned a lot out of that book. Um, it was actually drawn into it. Um, it was, you know, from the history of me being grown up with the Lancaster County, with the Amish, and how their history is, it kind of related a little bit towards what they look in their viewpoint. Um, and to take books out of a library that might be, you know, beneficial for some students and others, I don't think I could vote on censorship of books because I think it's part of our history. I think that someone who says, I don't like it, there's going to be a whole 15, 20 people over here saying, I do like it. Then you're going to have them argue back and forth, and a book that's taken out might be put back in 10 years because the other group went the other way. Um, I don't think it's something that as a board that we should really be getting into because as a board, we have many more other issues we have to deal with. Censorship is looking at a reading that one person takes in one context and one person takes in another. And I don't think that's a place at the school board. It's been said that it's not our job, and I'm glad that it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and if it was given to me, I would have to know what the 50 books were about before I could even answer yes or no whether I would consider taking them out, if it was my job. So that's my answer. That was quick. <laughs> it took me by surprise. Interesting question. When you asked it, the first thing I thought of is what, is what is the most abhorrent book that I can think of, and Mein Kampf jumped to mind. And I imagine that that is a useful teaching aid. It is a window inside the mind of a man that had an enormous influence on the 20th century. I think that if schools were to function as I would hope they would, it would be a place where we can be exposed to all kinds of ideas, some that we might find morally repugnant, but they can be put in context and taught as such. I think that schools ought to be somewhere where it is relatively safe to come in contact with ideas that you might not feel your children are so safe coming in contact without the context of teachers there to explain them. Now, I think that I can say that and I'll probably touch a nerve with some people's fear that um, schools have become indoctrination centers and they're going to dogmatically slant what they're teaching. I, I, I really don't want to get into that because uh, that's dogma and I don't think that our role is to uh, be drawn into dogma. I think that our role is purely pragmatic and that again comes down to providing an environment that is both safe and effective the teaching, and part of that teaching is critical thinking, and part of critical thinking is being able to recognize logically and morally flawed arguments, and being able to um, understand why. And in order to do that, you have to be exposed to them and have them dismantled, so that you can understand the component parts. Thank you. That was a great answer. Critical thinking is important. And it takes education to have critical thinking. So, you know, if we don't get back to educating, then we're not going to do this. this. This subject is such a much broader subject. What do we teach kids? How do we teach this? What is censored? What is not? No, you don't censor books. There was a movie with Kevin, Kevin Bacon in it, I think, that uh, had a lot to do with it. Was that 30 Days in? How many of them are Footloose, yes. And that talked about burning books in the streets. I don't think that's where we need to be. Although, when I was in college and a freshman, I was a little slow to get my first class. And I ended up in sociology. Uh, I arrived there, two guys and 15 girls. 
The book we had to read was Lesbian and All Female Prison. We lasted two days, and the teacher said, You gotta go, you got nothing to say on this matter, you won't even understand it. I was appreciative, I think I took wood shot. Uh, but when it goes to that subject, you know, we're talking CRT, we're talking sexual education of three year old or third graders, we're talking gender identification. These are all very complex issues. So when we're teaching, it has to be relating to the age. You know, if we're going to teach elementary school, school kids things, I don't think they need to learn about gender identification in third grade, okay? CRT, okay? We can all have our visions on CRT. But that may be a great civics course or a course in college that if you want to study. But I don't think that we, and if we're going to call it CRT, then we should say it. Because often in school, mm -hmm. it's coming through and it's being hidden under another name. Right. My son had to write a paper in English. He picked children in prison in Kent County. Mm -hmm. Children in prison. I said, what the heck were the two other choices? They had been terrible. Um, you know, so it's always going to be a question, what is appropriate, where we go, and we hope we use common sense. And if it is something that's against your moral values or religious values, it's very easy. Do an independent study. You know, let those that are interested do it. But if, if making somebody uncomfortable, I don't think we force it down their throat. Because you'll never get the right answer. And that's where I feel. Uh, give them a good education. Use common sense. We've been dealing with, not as a board, but a country, we've been dealing with book censorship for years. Um, you know, every every year, my life school library puts up a, a list of books that public opinion believes should be censored in our schools. Um, one of the things is that, you know, reading is fundamental to a child's life. We, we know that. Um, but what, I think one of the things is we don't, as a board, really don't handle the day-to-day -day curriculum. We don't vet, you know, the resources day-to-day. -day. And I think you get in a place that you you start to st stifle teacher autonomy. You start to stifle ideals being brought into the by students. Like it is up to that student, it is up to that parent to have that discussion about those values and what is important to them. And it's up to a parent to say, you know, hey, I don't want my child reading this book. Can I get another independent study? As Mr. Gale said, we have to be more open that those common conversations up. It is, it's bad business, because um, I've seen boards go through this, to start to censor books, start to censor what teachers are teaching, start to censor ideals. Um, but we have to focus on what do we want best for our children, what do we want best for our students, to help them grow as learners, and help them be the global citizens that they should be and desire to be. And what does that look like? We don't know. But that is the work of um, our educators to help find out and how we as a board can support that work is where, where we'll have to come in. I feel that books are a part of our American experience. We need to have, we need to look at every aspect. I personally like to look at both sides of the story. I heard a lot of cities around the country are getting rid of certain books and they want their school districts to have this book or that book. I think we have to have a well-rounded discussion on everything to come to a conclusion. I think if you take some out and leave some in, it's giving um, an unfair advantage to certain parts of the story. Thank you. There's a lot within that, Kerwin. Um, you know, everyone right now the fight is looking at money coming in the districts for teacher salaries. That's the biggest one. Um, hitting $60,000 by teacher salary by a certain year. That is going to definitely hurt the strain within King County to try to fulfill that. The money is also put in there um, for CTE programs. There's a specific fund line that says here's the money earmarked specifically just for CTE. And it cannot be moved anywhere else. Um, I have a son who's in this, came from a CTE program. I'm a full believer in making sure that program and is fully funded and make sure it goes through and make sure we are promoting that. Um, you're looking at also the, um, the health care and every, the health care issues for our students as part of it. So as a board member, making sure all of that within Kerwin if, is spent the way it's supposed to be spent, the way it is written to be spent. Um, if that means we have to somehow subsidize going like grants and stuff that it's not fully funding yet, 
um, then that's what we need to do. But as it is the blueprint, that is what we should be using, and as we should be fully funding, making sure all the programs are met within the Kerwin. I would like to learn more about the Kerwin, um, what it does fund and what it doesn't fund. I myself do, am not really well informed on uh, what it brings to the table. But if I was elected board member, and um, even up until that time, I will be looking into it to try to figure out um, more about it and learn more about it. Uh, because I'm running to do what's best for the school system and for our children. So whatever it entails um, that will benefit our children, benefit our schools, is definitely something that I'm going to see that comes to pass uh, because they deserve the best. <coughs> and I'm not one of board members that's going to set up and um, condone cutting them short. I want them to have everything that they deserve. And that's what I'm here for to give them something better than they may have right now. Because um, our children, they're lacking. And not only because of the pandemic but just in general. Um, and we need to give that attention to them and their situation. And because the purpose of having the King County Public School system is to see that our children have what they need, to see that they get the education that they deserve. So that is the reason that I'm running. And I will not fail if I'm elected. I will not fail the people or the children the parents or the teachers. Thank you very much. I, I would like to um, concur with my colleague to the, the left. I think this is our last question. It's an excellent time to restate that our purpose in being here is to ensure that the children of Kent County have the best possible education that we can provide them. And I think that we can do that. It's a matter of will. As far as the Kerwin report and the blueprint, I think that that is an excellent tool to help us move in that direction. It is worth pointing out that we are a small school district and this is a unique county. We are a collection of Title I schools and that brings unique challenges to the task of administrating. It's worth noting that when SOS went down to Annapolis and petitioned the legislation, the legislature, the legislature agreed and said, you guys do need help, you have brought good points, but you also have an enormous lot of, a lot of wealth popped up in your county. We see what the real estate's worth up there. We want you to help yourselves, but we will match any further money that your commissioners bring to your school budget and the commissioners declined that offer. That was money that we could have had that went to waste. So as a resource manager, that is the sort of thing that I would hold the commissioners to. Do not let free money go. I also feel that we can't expect our children to thrive. We talk about their mental health. We have to put the resources in our schools to make them feel that they are appreciated and they have been given a resource that is directed towards one singular goal, which is preparing them for their future once they leave school. I can understand how they would be frustrated and there would be respect and discipline issues if they look at this county and feel that we, they are constantly losing the lifeblood of the schools, which are students, which are drawn into private schools, which then decrease the funding that our schools get. And it is a positive feedback loop that exacerbates the problem. We must fund our schools adequately. Thank you. My esteemed uh, colleague, Mr. Pierce, brought up some good points um, that we do need help. And, uh, but the problem comes when, uh, as he served, freedom isn't free, and there is no such thing as free money. No. So if you look into the Kerwin uh, Commission and what they thought, they did say, that Maryland and Kent County has always been viewed as about 10% have all the wealth. You know, we have a shrinking blue collar uh, group and we have an expanded impoverished group. So though it looks like we have the money, I don't know that Kent County can afford the tax hike that it would take to fund that money because it's a shared matching cost. Okay, so that's one thing. Then the other thing is we might want to run it like a real business. If our, if our student uh, attendance is shrinking, 
and we have to come up with money, then we have to make tough decisions. And maybe we need to cut at the administrative level. So many of these programs are bloated. And all the administrators get all the money. The teachers don't get it. The kids' education doesn't see it. Because here's an example. I was at a board meeting, and they said, ah, fix it or everything. We're sorry. We're going to have to let six teachers go. Oh, by the way, did I tell you we're going to give the administration a raise? What they take in that money from that raise, they probably could get those six teachers. So this is what you have to be aware for. It looks great what you're trying to do, and I support it. And any help we can get, we need. We just want to make sure that next year you don't find out that you can't afford your mortgage because your taxes went up to pay for it, and none of the money actually affected the grades of your students. This problem with our, our, our children has been going on for 10 years. We're 30%. We have a 7% math efficiency at the elementary school. Only 40% of our students can handle further education. This system is broken. It's not a one-stop fix. It's going to take a lot of hard effort. They say there's only so much the board can do. We can do so much more as a county. We have been, the board has been doing uh, some work with Curly um, the, in the Blueprint of Maryland's Future that started way before recently. Um, and that work is already ongoing, and we see the impact of that work. We think about some of our schools. We have two schools who received the Concentration of Poverty Grant, which has now allowed two community school coordinators who are bringing in resources for the community. We have a health clinic at Rock Hall Elementary. We are bringing in community partners to help ensure that our students are being treated and cared for. So that work is ongoing. And there was work in there for a safety and mental health coordinator. That work is ongoing. So the work is beneficial, but the work doesn't stop. We know that we know we are, um, our funding structures here in King County have not always been our best friend. We know that sometimes our relationship with our county commissioners have not always been our best friend. So we have to do a better and a more due diligence approach to how do we work together? How do we work together to ensure that our school is fully funded? How do we work together that we're making sure that we are holding our, our school board accountable, our county commissioners accountable, our administration accountable. How do we make sure that those aspects of our blueprint of Maryland future, which is a $60,000 starting salary for our teachers, which is um, uh, governance and accountability measures, which is making sure that our struggling learners, which is bringing back administration back to the classroom, there's a lot in here. And it's going to take a team effort. It's not something we're going to be able to get overnight, but I believe we work together maybe start bringing, showing parts of our blueprint for our Maryland's future, bringing that to the community, letting community stakeholders ask questions, um, letting parents ask questions, and then what does that look like for Kent County? How do we then say a Kent County lens? Because I believe there's a such thing as a Kent County lens. And how do we take that lens, and how do we make that, and embed that into the blueprint, so that our students, who our children who we know best, are learning and can experience? I don't think, money is going to solve all of our problems. It starts at the ground level, it starts at the uh, elementary schools, it starts at the home, it starts with the parents. There's going to be plenty of money, but we need to straighten out our school system right now. We need respect from the students and the teachers, and there's going to be the leads money, there's going to be the money from the gun control, there's gambling money that's coming into the Kerwin Fund, um, and then the school has a six-year plan, so there's so many items out there, but I don't think money is the main source. We're going to have money. We need to start from ground up. Kerwin is is not the friend to Kent County. It's going to be to some of the bigger school districts. I mean, it's already been talked about. The, forming fun, fun, the funding formula is actually to our disadvantage. Um, we're a small rural county, for example. One of the things that the Kerwin uh, blueprint assures is universal pre-K. We've been doing that for years and we've been paying for it for ourselves. Um, the big question is going to be the are we going to get the money we're supposed to get? You know, there's there's a state allocation, but it's a mandate, and as the commissioners will tell you, it's one more of those things that they've been told they have to do without being told how they're supposed to do it. Nobody wants to see their taxes raised. You got three ways to revenue. You take the money away from another department, you grow your economy, or you raise taxes. To grow your economy doesn't happen overnight. Um, accountability, the 
school district is going to be held accountable by the state. Every school district had to get an accountability. I mean, there is somebody, that's their job. Initially, it was Dr. Couch, and she shared it with Pat Merritt, because we didn't know what was going to be asked, asked of us. Um, the, I don't know how to answer that question, because we're not going to get the money we think we're going to get. And when we don't get that money, how many times in education have we seen we're going to do this, this, and this, and right before we get there, the rules have to be changed because it's obvious we can't meet that obligation. So I can't answer your question because I think we're, we're almost set up for failure. I just want to say that if I'm elected, I will do all that I can to make the changes that is needed for the King County Public School System and our children. I'll just do the, I'll, um, teachers and the school system itself. And um, I also want to stop the finger pointing because uh, we have a lot of times where everybody's pointing the finger. The commissioner's pointing the finger. The board of ed is pointing the finger. The teachers are pointing the finger. Uh, then the parents are pointing the finger. I believe that all these people need to work together uh, to make a better school system, um, to come to a solution for the problems that we are having. I believe that if we work together and even include the community, that a lot of what we're going through um, could be solved. I have also heard that even if we raise the taxes, a lot of the taxes that, that are given uh, the lowest amount goes to the King County school system. It's really used in other ways, and the school is not um, getting the majority of it. It's so even if we raise the taxes, if the taxes continue to go in the areas in other areas, then the school will still be setting the same way that it's setting now. So we need to all come together and really figure out what we can do to uh, rectify the problem that we have. And I also want to say that this problem didn't just start four years ago. It didn't start 10 years ago. Um, maybe some of the financial problems, but as far as our, our problem with the curriculum, maybe learning or um, uh, not having, um, well, equality and different things like that, when I went to school, I experienced it. So I don't want my next generation to experience the things that I have that hasn't gotten better in all of these years on 57. It's been stated that the Kerwin blueprint puts us at a funding disadvantage. I don't argue with that. Again, I'm here as a logistician. I see my responsibility is to ensure that the school is adequately resourced. I think that this county has spent 30 years of, or three decades marketing itself as a vacation destination, as a retirement destination. Uh, the amount of people that it takes to work, the land, the ability of the bay to support watermen, those things have decreased. What we have got is an aged population that is growing in size and a young population that is decreasing in size. That puts our schools at a disadvantage. It also means that I do not think that we've been particularly honest in market, how we've marketed ourselves as a county. If we are marketing ourselves as a retirement destination or a vacation destination, we should be honest enough to tell the people that are buying the real estate to retire or have a vacation home on that the cost of living in a verdant and green county is that your property will be taxed sufficiently to support the young people that remain here. We owe them that and we should be honest up front when we do that. I think that 30 years of neglect and how we have funded our schools and has allowed the growth of the private schools within the county also to the detriment of our schools. I think that it has given us a vertical curve that we have to overcome. It is not going to be easy and it will not be quick. It will require willpower. You do not fix a 30-year-old problem by walking to the wall and flipping a switch. That is unreasonable. Nobody has that power. If we had all the resources we want tomorrow, it would still require years for that effect to happen because you have to build capability, you need competencies, and you need students to be in the system long enough to reflect those changes. I think if we can do any one thing that would be a one-trick pony to improve the general condition of our county, it is education. If we have a superior educational system, people will live here even if they're not working here. If the people come here for the schools, then businesses will follow them. 
Thank you. I'm a parent. I'm a friend of parents. I know a lot of kids. I also respect the fact that there are a lot of people with color like my hair out in that audience, and they do care about their students because their taxes go to it. So how we go and approach the issue of our students, the first thing we have to realize, it's kids first, okay? We've talked a lot about bureaucracy and what we can't do and how terrible things are and just about every uh, crazy thing that we could talk about tonight. But we haven't talked about, we're going to have to reach these children. The school board says it can do this, it can't do that. It can do a lot of things. It's a, it should be a shining light for where we go. It can send letters to Maryland saying we disagree. You know, it can encourage parents. Okay, a parent's bill of rights to say, hey, Maryland, this is what we want. If we work together, we can solve it. But for some reason, for all these years, all I ever hear is just the kids. The kids are, are not kids literally at the high school level. The kids at the younger level. We start there. We get their attitude that they're straight. We show them respect. They give us respect. We teach the goal rule. We move up the ladder to high school. And then we can offer true change. Because these students have every right to a bright future. Whether it's going to college or not. I mean, they are, in this day and age, college isn't the only game. This vocational training. It needs to be expanded at the school system. Okay, and these are things as a board we can talk about. We, we don't have to cowardly hang out and say this is all we can do and nothing else. There's a lot of things we can do if we step up because this is Kent County, okay? I had somebody talk to me, it's happening in every county. Nice young lady right there. I hate to say it, I don't give a damn about any other county. I care about Kent County, okay? <laughs> you know, somebody said you don't cross the Bay Bridge, I said I don't cross the Chester River Bridge, okay? <laughs> That's all this cool stuff. All right, so we're going to fix this. We're going to fix it together, or we're not going to fix it at all. And I thank you for considering me for Board of Education. Again, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for setting up this forum. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, the public, uh, attending in person and online, and then my fellow candidates for enduring this evening. Uh, we have, in Kent County, a great community. We have great students, great educators, and we are doing some transformational things in our county school system. We are making educational advancements and we are leading across the state of Maryland and other areas. We're not always at the lead in testing. We're leading on the state level. We're leading on the, the shore level with a lot of our approaches and our, our ways that we're doing things in this county and those things go unnoticed. My goal of running again is to continue to elevate that work. No, we have not done all the things correctly and nobody will and nobody's going to solve all the problems. Like Ms. Dorsey said, and like it's been said, some of our problems are 30-year problems, 50-year problems. We're still dealing with, you know, schools that are almost 70 years old. So we see that, that, that investment in education. But education is near and dear to my heart. Education is, with, is really the cornerstone of our development. And I want to help continue to elevate that, continue to shine light on King County Public Schools, to continue to find solutions, quality solutions to the problems that we can solve. We, there's no problem we can't solve, but there are problems we can elevate today and solve them today. So continue to work together, continue to work with this community to continue to ensure that our students are getting the maximization of teaching and learning for our world that they're about to enter into. Thank you. Many thanks to the league, to Sam, and all the attendees that came tonight. It's really nice to see a lot of people that are interested in our school system. We live in a paradise here in Kent County, as far as I'm concerned. This is one of the best counties in the whole state of Maryland and a lot of parts in this country. One thing we need is more inclusivity in our school system. We need better governance, accountability, and transparency. For example, if a teacher wants to say something, there's a whistleblower law. They're not going to get you know, chastised or get in trouble for it. They won't get fired. A lot of that is happening in the school system. Facts. We are low in the state compared with other schools. And we need another fact is we need to keep people here. We need to keep our own that are grow up here, to, uh, that want to teach here, to stay here. I think um, a lot of students are going to Queen Anne's County, a lot of students are going to private schools. We need to have more uh, local people come out to the high school, have tours, and have people that don't even go out there, might, might not even know where the school is, and walk through the halls and meet the people and meet the teachers and see how the classes are going. 
another thing in Kent County, we need more affordable housing. I think we need to work with the local government because if teachers come here, a lot of them are going to go to um, up to Wilmington or Middletown, or those areas, because the, the housing is cheaper there. We need to have an ingenious plan. It has to be a really inventive plan to, to make things right here in this county. I want the opportunity for change, and I want the opportunity to serve the students in Kent County. Thank you. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having this forum. I'm glad that we were able to do it in person. I want to thank my fellow candidates here. I also want to mention that the school board election is nonpartisan. Education has become a partisan issue. And I'm going to tell you what I stand for, and it does not have anything to do with whether I'm blue or I'm red. I want our community to feel welcome in our schools. I want a staff that feels valued, supported, and listened to. I want to be able to adequately fund our, our, the, the programs we want to offer. I want to provide the same opportunities for all students. Not every kid is created equal, but every kid should have the same opportunity. And I want our schools to be safe. And safe in the year 2020 is not what's safe in the year 2010. I'm talking about physical safety, and I'm talking about social and emotional well-being. And that goes for our teachers and our staff as, a way of our, as, a, 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 as well as our students. Again, I shouldn't be boxed in by which, which party I am or which party I'm not. Everybody should be able to do that. I ran because I am a high school, I am a teacher. I know I've been, I'm here working every day and with the kids. I see what the kids want. I hear what they kids, I hear them in the hallway, I hear them in clubs, I do clubs, I coach sports, I do pretty much everything that I'm barely at home at some points because I'm with the kids. My goal is to run because I want to make sure they have what they need, what the teachers need, what the administrators need, to make sure everything is equitable across the board. To make sure this one kid can do this club and this kid can do this club. Not just saying, oh, you don't have the money to do it. No, we need to make sure the clubs are there for everybody. That's something I want to do. You know, it takes, in the old song, it takes a village. It takes this community to make education what it is. It's not the board's complete control. It is about having the students buying in, having the parents buying in, having every stakeholder buy into the education system to, to elect people to sit on the board to make decisions once a month. That's not enough. It takes everybody to do it every single day of the school, every year of the year. It's everybody. Everyone needs to take part. That means that we have to make this great communication between us and the county commissioners because we need to work as one unit to provide the education for our students. That's why I was here. Um, I do need to make one correction within the Delaware State thing we did. It is five years, but it's three years. We suspended data. Two years are on the legislation for the next couple. So that equals my five years. Um, and I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, for the League of Women Voters for hosting this and for all the candidates up here. Um, vote for me. Well, that concludes tonight's forum. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting this event on, and many thanks to Benaria Street Alliance for hosting the evening. But especially thank you to the candidates.